uh, Romans 6, let's begin reading at verse number 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Let's read that again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Let's read that again. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Alright, one more time. For sin shall not have dominion over you. Amen. Amen. We got that? We got that because every once in a while, we'll go through something where we feel like, I just can't help it. I just, I just, I have to do this thing. No, sir, you do not have to. We're going to deal with this a little while. For ye are not under the law. Now, that's incredible. But under grace. I just want you to listen to this because I'm going to explain it as best as I can in a few moments of what it means to be under. You are not under the law, but you are under grace. What then? Shall we sin because we are not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death, or of obedience unto righteousness. If you don't understand what I just read, it's basically telling you that there's more than one servant you can serve. And the one you choose to obey is the one that becomes your master. Amen. Now, I just read that. Verse 15 says, What then uh, shall we sin because uh, we are not under the law, but under grace, God forbid. Now we find out. Let's go to 17. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Oh, yes, ye was. Don't think too high of yourself, least you fall. But ye have obeyed from the heart now that's incredible. I need to hit that again. From the heart, not the flesh. But you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered um, you. Oh, praise God. Being then made free from sin. Now I'm, I'm going to deal with all this today. I'll try to move quickly because I meet some people that says I don't sin. Because I'll read this verse. It says being made free, being made, M-A-D-E, -E, free from sin. And then I'll turn them over to 1 John. It says, if any, any man say he has not sinned, he is a liar, because lest we rightly divide the word of truth, we do not understand it and we'll miss it. So here, being then made free of sin, ye became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as ye have yielded your members servant, ye have done this now, servants to uncleanness, and to iniquity unto iniquity, even so now yield your members servants to righteousness unto holiness. For when ye were the servants of sin, ye were free from righteousness. That's incredible. Hopefully I won't forget to deal with that. 21, what fruit had ye then in those things whereof ye are now ashamed? For the end of those things is death, but now being made free from sin and become servants, we're free but we're servants, we're free but we're servants, I'll get there, uh, to God ye have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. That's a mouthful. Amen. Everything in there is a mouthful, don't you think? And the question remains, is the church under the law or is it under grace? The question remains because so many times we deal with things on, on that level uh, where it's got to be one or the other. It's got to be one or the other. Uh, in here we find out we are free from sin, but yet we know we still sin. We know that Jesus came and John said, Behold the Lamb of God that take away the sin of the whole world, but yet sin remained. <coughs> we know that Paul would write to us and says, When I would to do good, evil is always present. Amen. We know that Paul says uh, he finds a new law in his members that there is a warring within himself. Not warring necessarily from somebody else, but just within him home, home self. Because he understands that those things that he ought not to do, he what? And those things that he does, at times he ought not to do. So then we find out that where are we and where do we stand in this thing? I want you to understand a few things. So I, I'm going to turn over to a couple things that I've got marked. I'd like to take it in a little bit of an order if I can. And I want you to look at the book of Matthew. You don't have to. 
But if you want to follow along, just in case you may think I'm throwing something in there, just to slide it in real quick. I want you to look at verse number, chapter 5 and verse number 17. Now, I must not have needed that one over there because I just pulled my marker out. <laughs> Amen. Matthew chapter 5, <laughs> Matt Bernil. I wish I hadn't done that. I studied a long time. That's all right. Amen. Look at chapter 5, verse number 17. Jesus is here. Jesus is the one speaking this. The things I read out of Romans are written to us by Paul. But I want you to listen to the words of Jesus. Think not, in verse number 17 of chapter 5 of Matthew, think not that I am come to destroy the law. Now hold a minute. Are we living under the law or are we living under grace? Jesus says, think not that I have come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Now we know the end of the world has not yet come. We know that there are doomsday preachers. We know the battle of Armageddon. We read all these things. We know that maybe it's high time and it draws nigh. When you see these things, no, it's even at the door. But he told us the law will not pass until all pass. Amen? So we know the law is not done away with. We know that Christ did not come to do away or destroy the law. Look at verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and teach men... Uh, so he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven, but whosoever shall, and this is important, I'm reading this, shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. And I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, ye shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. So we find out that Christ did not come to do away with the law, but to fulfill the law. Now, in Galatians, and that's the, that's the one that I, I just missed right here, and, and one of you uh, uh, scholars probably can, can find it for, for us better, but if we, we find out that Jesus uh, fulfilled the law. Anybody ever read that? I wanted to read it to you for you, but He fulfilled the law. But I do want to read something in Galatians, and it's chapter 3 and verse number 23. I'll wait for you for just a moment. 23, 24, and 25. Now, I want to show you why the law is still there and why it cannot go away, nor should it go away. The law should absolutely not go away. Amen. Galatians chapter 3 and verse number 23, 24, and 25 says, But before faith came, we were kept by the law. Shut up unto faith, which should afterwards be revealed. Wherefore, the law was our schoolmaster, to bring us unto Christ, that we might be justified by faith, but after that faith has come, we are no longer under the schoolmaster. <laughs> now we find that things are beginning to change. And I, I want you to go to Romans chapter 13. Now I'm going to try my best to explain all this in just a moment, if you'll allow me. I want you to go to Romans chapter 13 and verse number 8. Let me, when you get there, somebody say amen. amen. We are dealing with the law and grace. We are dealing with God's love for humanity. We are dealing with God's our love for God. And we are dealing with our love one for another. How do we know we pass from death unto life? Because we love the brethren. Because we love the brethren. Amen. Amen. There is no greater love than this that one would lay down his life for another for his friend. Amen. So let's read in verse number 8. Owe no man anything. <laughs> I know the church wants to make everything about money, but I don't. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. But to love one another. For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. law. Jesus came not to destroy the law, but that the law may be fulfilled. See, Jesus fulfilled the law how? By loving. By loving. Yeah. For God is love and God is a spirit. Now we find out that not just Jesus can fulfill the law. Who else can fulfill the law? We can. When is the law fulfilled? He that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Now listen to me in verse 9. For this, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. But stop for a minute. How do you steal from somebody you love? You don't. 
If you can steal from somebody, you don't have love for that person. How can you kill something that you love? You cannot. You cannot. You cannot. I'm going to deal with this in a minute. We're going to get hard and heavy. Thou shalt not bear false witness. I'll tell you the truth. Anybody that tells you they love you and they lie on you, they don't love you. Now, I know this is going to be hard in a minute, but we're going to deal with are we under the law or are we under grace? Amen. Thou, thou shalt not covenant, and if there be any other commandment, we know there is in Leviticus law, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, not briefly comprehended, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is fulfilling of the law. Love is the fulfilling of the law. Are we under the law? Yes, at times we are. Are we under grace? Yes, at times we are. When do we know the difference? Well, I'll put it this way. Let's deal with a couple of things about the law. When Jesus was here in the world, one day they caught a woman in the very act of adultery. Three men brought her in and set her before the Lord. How many knows this story? And listen to the wordings of the men because they were devout men. They were from the temple. They were priests. They said the law says this woman is to be stoned. Said the law of Moses said this woman is to be stoned. But what do you say? Now we're going to deal with something here on, on why we understand the Bible the way that it has to be. Jesus got down and He begins to just basically waste some time. He's not even going to deal with it. He sits down and starts writing in the sand. In a moment, he looks up at them because they are pretty persistent and says, the law says death. The law brings death. Sin, when it is conceived, brings death. And the Bible says that Paul said, I knew not sin except by the law. The law brings us to, the law is a schoolmaster that brings us to Christ. Why Christ? Because it will bring you to a point where you realize you need a Savior. It will bring you to Christ when you realize you cannot save yourself. So the, they asked him and he said, The law says that she is to be stoned. Jesus didn't come to do away with the law. He came to fulfill the law. Because you cannot condemn something you love. You cannot stone something you love. The Bible says that the law is fulfilled in love. And here it says, Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal. The, the law would bring it in and say you're guilty. Grace will walk in and say, I love you. Yeah. That's why Jesus said, Late woman, because here's the, here's the big deal in this story, and I'm going to hit a few more. Here's the big deal. He said, He that's without sin, He that's without sin, cast the first stone. By the law, Sister Donna. The Bible tells us this about the law, and I love this. I, I'm going to hit just a little bit. But if you break one part of the law, you did what? You broke it all. You broke it all. So now we find out that we are guilty if we just tell a little lie against somebody. We might as well, really that's bad wording, but we're guilty of all the law. We're all guilty of sin, punishable unto death. But they bring a woman and says, the law says she shall die. Jesus come to fulfill the law. He come not to judge the sin, but to love humanity. For God loved us so much. The Bible says in John 3, 17, He came not into the world to condemn the world. Now here the law is presented and said it's condemning. She should die, but what do you say? When they got up and left the room, because when you think you have the right to judge, you better take heed whenever you start looking at somebody else. And Jesus telling these of the temple, the priest of that day, He said, He that's without sin. He that's without sin. If you ain't, it, because you understand in a minute what He was really saying to them about He that's without sin. Oh my God. But anyway, He said, cast first stone. Then He looks at the woman and it says, where is thy accuser? Because when the schoolmaster brings us to Christ, the schoolmaster no longer can remain. The teacher can no longer remain when you realize you need a Savior. Let's deal with something else a minute. Because you cannot have both. We read this a moment ago back there in Romans, and this is good if you stay with me. You cannot have both. Oh, let's, let's deal with something else first. Jesus on the Sabbath day was walking through a cornfield with His disciples. And you'll get this in a moment. I know I'm having a hard time up here this morning. 
But you'll get it in a minute. He's walking through a cornfield with his disciples, and they begin to pluck ears of corn. Now here comes those of the law. And the law should always be enforced. Here comes those of the law. that said it is not lawful for your disciples to do this. Have you not read in the law? But they are walking with Christ. They are walking with Him. And they are hungry. And he turns basically and looks at one of them and says, And which one of you having an oxen that if it was to fall in a ditch on a Sabbath day would not go down and get that ox out? And they thought about it for a minute because who wants to lose an ox? I know today cattle's what? Two, three, four, five thousand hours ahead? Something. And, and to sit there and leave it there and let the thing die because you can't go get it. In other words, love will conquer everything. When the disciples and them are weary on a journey and they're walking through a cornfield and there's food right there and Jesus says, hey, if you're hungry, go ahead and eat. Go ahead and eat. Because what we'll do with people is we'll judge them under law. Are we under the law? Sure we are if we choose to be. How do you mean that, preacher? Because the Bible says when they come out of Egypt and Joshua took over, that the day come that he says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But what he had just said is, if, if it pleases you to go back into Egypt, to live back under the bondage of the persecution, go ahead. But as for me and my house, Amen. we're going to serve the Lord. I can walk into about any church in America and tell you who's living under the law. What does it take to fulfill the law? Love. Love. This morning our Sunday school teacher said, perfect love cast about fear. All fear. All fear. All fear. So love will take care of fear. But when love is perfect, it casts out all fear. Perfect love casts out all fear. Paul will write to us, and some of us know this story. It's, it's during the time that he says, uh, putting those things behind and reaching forth on those things which are before. And he knows what he's saying right there. He definitely knows what he's saying. But he says, not, a, not as though I am perfect already, because perfect love casts out all fear. When we judge somebody else, and I, and I know we do, we, we, we use the law when it's beneficial. Paul said it like this. He said, all things are all for me, but not all things are expedient. What do you mean by that, Brother Robert? When you really learn how to love with the love of God, you'll see people the way God sees them. You'll see that they came and said it's not lawful for them to eat. And you'll see that God will say that they're hungry. And you'll also see one other yeah. thing. That the law was not given by man, but for man. Yeah. The law doesn't belong to any of us. I told somebody this morning, and we always use examples, or we try to, but I want to, I want to get some place this morning, that I'm so thankful that there's a speed limit sign. I'm thankful for the law. But now when I... When I travel down the highway, because the law is designed, and I want you to get this, I, I, I'm, I'm not almost done, but I want you to get this, that the law, think of any law that you can think of this morning in the land, and I know we're a fallen people and all laws aren't perfect, but 99% of them are there to protect you. The law is there to protect you. We was on the interstate, and it used to be I can't drive 55, 55 miles per hour on the interstate, and then it went up to 70. Everybody didn't get that, but you did. <laughs> now it's 70 miles per hour. Why is it 70? Because statistically, they found out that we could increase it by 15 yeah. and still be safe. As soon as we got off exit 36 and made a left, immediately it went into 35 miles per hour. I told those in the car with me this morning, not that I was dealing with all this, but a question was asked about what I was preaching and they didn't know what I was preaching. So immediately it went to 35. And I said, check it out. Here's houses on both sides. Here's front yards. There's potential of kids running out in front of me. So they're basically, the law is not just there to protect me of saying, you need to slow down to 35. It's also looking around to protect somebody else. Because when God says, thou shalt not kill, it's not just for me. It's that also to protect everybody else. So when we use the law in our favor, it's not even our law. It's God's law. Originally, a covenant was made with Abraham. And originally, they circumcised on the eighth, eighth day. And then when Melchizedek, we find out that sacrifice was made. But then when God come, come on the scene and brought them out of Egypt and brought them out of this bondage, 
and tried right there to instill this faith in this something greater because we find out in the Bible, he says, I'll make a more perfect covenant. I'll, 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 I'll do this thing. What is it? The Bible says the greatest of these. What is it? Faith, hope, and love. And the greatest is because now we find the law is fulfilled. Now whenever somebody does do something to us, we find out that the light that we can be to the world, the greatest light we can be is to love them. Because when I love you, I will not harm you. When I love you, I will not cheat you. When I love you, and that type of love, that God type of love, that, that covers a multitude of sin. You remember this? How is that that love can cover sin? How is it that, that our kids can do something and mess up, but because we're the parent, we can look down and love them and say, that's okay, just don't go do it again. Yeah. Come on, that's what he told to the woman. Where's our accusers? Neither do I condemn thee. Just go and sin no more. Because now we can start understanding that love is greater than the law. Are we living under the law? If you want to be. The law was never destroyed. The law is there. But the law will judge you. Many have departed from the faith. From what? Grace. Turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. And here he even warns us that because we now are under grace, do we sin? God forbid that we sin. But we still have the law there. Because the truth of the matter is, let me put it this way. Now I'm not doing the law because I'm a servant and have to. I'm not making it to heaven because I don't steal or I don't bear false witness. Now all of a sudden, because I love, I want to. Right. Now because I love you, I want to do these things. I talked to a preacher this week about servant and friendship. And I found that my friends serve me. Because you can't move from a servant to a friend and leave the servant behind. It has to remain in you. The difference is, is now I want to do it. A friend would do something for you and don't expect nothing in return. A friend would do something for you because they just love you. And they want to better you. And they want to make sure you, you make it and you succeed or whatever it is that, that, that they happen to be doing at the time. That's what makes a friend. Now we have a greater covenant through Christ because in that what the law could not do, it being weak, it could not save a man. The, the, because this, the law is out there to do 70, it cannot save me because somebody else could break that law, get me head on, be driving drunk, and now I would die, but I will not die by the law. The law is there as the protection, the guidance. The law is there for us. That's why whenever you come in and teach, and it, and it talks about that if you go into a man's house and one eat of herbs on the, uh, and, and one doesn't eat herbs, he says the one that eat of herbs, eat it on the God. The one that doesn't eat of herbs, eat it on the God. They're both doing it on the God, and he says, who are you to judge? That's the way the law and grace works too. That's why if, if, if I need to have long sleeves to serve God, and you need to have short sleeves, to serve God. Come here, you got short sleeves. Let me, let me let me see you just a moment. Raise up that right holy hand. I'll raise up my left. Now, because I love the brother, Amen. I don't even see the short sleeves no more. Amen. We're not under the law. We're under grace. We pass through the law. We understand that now all these things that God said, this is for your safety. Don't lie to that man. Don't bear false accusations against him. Lord have mercy, don't kill him. All these things that the law tells me I've got to do, but now all of a sudden, I've passed beyond that. Because all of a sudden, God's put something down in my heart to look at Clayton and say, you know what? God created him in his image and his likeness. This is a child of the king. And all of a sudden, he'll come in and I'll say, oh, brother, you broke the law in this church. Go home and get you on a shirt. When you get your shirt on, you come on back, all right? You think I'm playing? Go. No, sit down. <laughs> this is what love will do to you. When you get the love, I, I told some people, Gandhi, Gandhi read our Bible. God, I know this is going to be different, but I'm different. When you can't handle the different, get rid of me. There's, there's a thousand others that'd be glad to come here. I promise you that. But Gandhi read our Bible and said, I love your Jesus, but it'll have no effect on the world. And they asked him why. And he said, because people won't do it. He said, they just simply won't do it. If they would just love people beyond that heart, 
Because there is safety in love. There is holiness in love. God said, be ye holy as I am holy. For God loved us so much that He looked down. We could not reconcile. We could not live it. We could not walk it. God never expected that. What God said was it would bring you to a place where you'll need me. God, the first king they had, King Saul, and then King David. The people said, we've got to have a king. We've got to have a king. God said, you've got me. You've got me. Well, we've got to have a king. God said, all right, I'll give you a king. All God ever wanted was to be able to love you and I and us love back. That's why that covenant is made out of a covenant of love where it was sacrificed blood and it will cost blood. If we as a Christian church today would get back a hold of love, there's nothing greater. There's nothing greater than love. The Bible says the fruit of the Spirit will go into Pentecostal churches all over the place that will talk about the Spirit that moves. Even our sign says where the Spirit flows free. Do you know the very first word that comes after? Now these are the fruit of the Spirit. Love. Joy and peace. And long suffering. Ah, somebody this week, I was doing a little Bible study about suffering. We was going to different places. But the Bible says that God is long suffering. Long suffering, but not without a cause or a reason. Because His long suffering was accounted unto salvation. In other words, God's suffering. Did you know that not only do we suffer with Christ, God suffers. Our holy God Almighty, Jehovah God, suffers. The Bible says He is long-suffering. Why is He suffering? Look at humanity. Look at the curse of sin. Look how we destroy one another. How we, The Bible says don't to be easily consumed when you devour one another. Whenever we do these things, it, God is, it suffers God Himself. And He looked down, but the Bible said He's long-suffering. That... If it counted on salvation, what does that mean when you rightfully divide it? That it's not His will and He would perish. Why is that? That we got some people says, Oh, God don't care nothing about you. You're a big fat sinner. And the Bible says it's not God's will that any should perish, but all come to repentance. Do we live under the law? If you want to, if you want to, on the interstate we go up there, and I know that there's always exceptions, and God knew there would be too. Some people would never need to be pulled over by a policeman. They understand this is the law. I ain't got a problem with it. It's put here for me, take my family, take those other cars around me. I ain't got a problem with it. And they've already moved on. And they don't even think about it no more. Other people get on there and say, man, I can't drive this slow. Man, I just can't do this. Where's the love? If you even stop and think about it like that because you're jeopardizing and taking the risk of somebody else. And, I, and I'm not here to minister about driving the speed limit. Amen. So please don't think I am. I'm trying to get you to see the law. I'm trying to get you to see the need for the law. Anybody that thinks we don't need the law of God, don't understand when they get on over there a little while later that that law was going to be revealed. Any, any, I, I tell my kids all the time, even my grandson, he's four years old, and he already can spot a cop car. There's a cop. There's a cop. There's a cop. And I'll tell him, I'll say, you better be glad there is a God. I'll say, you better be glad of it. You better be glad there is a law. Yeah. Because there will come a day when that lawlessness one will be revealed. But the, what the law could never do for you. I know that some of us will look at it, and I, I just use this for example. And I know we talk about long hair, short hair, and, and, and it works both ways. Because those that judge you for not having it this way, then you'll turn around and think something wrong with them because they do. It's not like that. It's love them. And them love you. They may never love you back. But you know what? If you can love somebody that comes to church with one shoe on as much as you love the person that's got on two, then you pass through this thing. You've entered into this covenant with God to where Christ will come down. And He'll say, I know it's Sunday, but they're hungry. And I care about them. They've been with me all week working for me. They've been doing these things. And he said, love will bring us past all that. That's why no matter where you look in your Bible and you go down through there, and especially in this New Testament, you'll sit there because I've had people that only wanted to argue with me about the Bible and the Bible contradicts itself and all this. And then they'll say, why should I serve Jesus? He was a lawbreaker. He broke the law here. He broke the law here. He broke the law here. Anybody in here ever thought about that? You ever sit there and nobody else could do this on Sunday? Here comes Jesus. Does he just think he's a little better than everybody else? Does he just think it's okay that he does it? Uh, it's even okay that those are hanging around with him. You talk about a clique. People worry about cliques or all this kind of stuff. You need to learn how to love. 
Because Jesus didn't worry about that kind of stuff at all. What Jesus did was say, hey, love will bring us through every bit of this. Amen. When you love somebody, there's nothing you can't work out. When you love somebody, I'm telling you today, the, down, the downfall of Christianity is the lack of love. Amen. That's all it simply is. The lack of love. Amen. When all somebody can see when they look at you is the clothes you got on. Brother, they so under the law and they so bound. They sit in there just examine you up and down. Now, I don't mean there ain't wrong. Should we sin? No, God forbid. But what I am saying is where's your heart at today? When the only thing you can see in your own children or your own spouse or your own church is every time somebody messes up and then you think you're holy because you've got a holy law, there's no holy law. There is no holy law. You think because, you know what there are? There are more law enforcers in the church these days than any day I've ever been in in my life. They can point out every fault, every failure and bring it and it sounds like it lines up with the Bible. I'll tell you, the woman caught in the very act, the law says stoner. But what do you say? People will come right into your church and say that the, the Bible says this. I bought this week. The Lord just dealt with me this week. It says over there, because I don't know why. This is such small stuff. I wish we could just run this race with a little more patience. But we, we get so caught up in clothes. Over in Leviticus, you know, even if we leave the dress and the pants and all that. But it, but it basically says this. It says that man shall not wear that that pertaineth to a woman. And woman shall not wear that that pertaineth to a man. And, and now we're confused. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And every picture I've ever seen of Jesus in my life, He didn't have on any of these. Right. He didn't even have on a pair of... I've never seen Jesus with a pair of jeans. I, I've never seen Him with a pair of dress pants. I, I, as a matter of fact, when you go home and Google it today, you can't do more. They weren't even invented yet. Yep, so then whenever we read that and we say, well, you know, the men wear pants and the women wear... And I'm not kicking because you should wear a dress if you want to wear a dress. I give God what, my very best. But what I am saying is perfect love casts about all fear. What does that mean? It means I've met people that says, I'm afraid to come to church because I ain't got nothing to wear. Yeah. Where'd that come from? I met people that would drop off somebody else and I'd go out there and beg them, why don't you get out of the car and come in? I'm not the restaurant. Who are you trying to please? Right. You're wearing clothes. Amen. Come on. Amen. Amen. I told you, I'll go on one ear and out the other time. I can already tell it is. When you get to that kind of love, fear begins to leave. Yeah. When you get to that kind of love and all of a sudden you say, you know what? I don't look like everybody else. And God says, I know you don't. I don't want you to look like a bounce. I don't even want you to act like a bounce. When you get that kind of love down in your heart, you'll look past, and why will you look past? Because you'll start seeing the soul. Because the soul that sinneth shall surely die. We already know this is going to die. We already know that the body is going to return to the dust of the earth from whence it came. But the spirit's going to return from whence it came. And we already know that man has a spirit, and we already know that man has a soul. And we already know that the, in Revelations two times, not just one, the souls under the altar of heaven Amen. was mentioned in heaven. And we know the soul that sinned will surely die. Now whenever you see your brother and you look at him, you should be looking at him with a type of love that says, man, I want more than anything for you to know God. I want more than anything. If the world today had a church that had the love of Christ, but what happened to it? The law would come in. And the law will crucify it as often as it can. But that's okay. Because love hung on a cross. Hot love walked up Mount Calvary's yes, hill. Love Amen. had nails driven down in his hand. And Jesus said, I'll deal with that too because there's no greater love than this anyways. And guess what else love would do? Father, forgive them because they know not what they do. And Brother Neil, your Bible tells you had they have known who he was. Yeah. Hey, sometimes if people just knew who you was, if they just knew that God's Spirit dwelt down in you, even though everything on the outside may not be the way they think it ought to be, if it lines up with God, He'll bring you through that and you'll meet Jesus. Yeah. You'll, you'll have the law to be the schoolmaster to bring you to Christ. And then whenever they sit down and say, but the law says this, now what do you say? And I'll turn to them and say, I think y'all don't love them a little more. I think y'all just shed a little love and a brawl. I, I just think really that's what's missing. 
What's the greatest, folks? Love. Let's try it. What's the greatest? Love. What does this world need? Love. What does this church need? Love. What, what, what does God think they deserve? Love. Love cover a multitude of sin. Love cover a multitude of sin. How's that work? I probably don't even have to explain it. Anybody that's got children or anybody that's ever been married knows love covers a multitude of sin. I don't know if you even caught that when I read that a minute ago, but he did breaks one of the little commandments here of being least in the kingdom. I met people that says 99 and a half won't do, brother. We sing that song, 99 and a half won't do. I'm not criticizing this morning. I'm trying to show you how the enemy comes in to destroy grace of God. And that grace is shown through love to destroy the love of God. 99 and a half won't do until you get it perfect. But I suppose not even come on back. Why don't you just try to love me if I'm only getting a half percent right anyways? Just try to show me a little bit of love. Because he said, those that break in, in these little commandments and teach men so also, and we have a lot of that, they'll be least in the kingdom. Didn't say nothing about salvation or being thrown in the outer darkness or where the worm died not. Didn't say any of that. I'm telling you, if we get a hold of love, it'll change our world. If we get a hold of love, it'll change our church. If we get a hold of the love of God, it'll change our society. You know what's missing in Washington, D.C.? Love. They always talk about the Democrats and the Republicans, the standoff. Well, they call it gridlock, 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 I think, where nothing's moving. Everything's just bound. Somebody talked to me recently about being bound when something's bound. What binds? They were down in Egypt. They were bound. You know when, they, when those shackles come free? Through love. Through love. There's no greater love. Whenever you can look at somebody and say, hey, I ain't got no problem with that. Uh, not, not that everything they do is right. That's not the point. But when you can look at them and say, I love you anyways. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Oh, then all of a sudden when there's somebody smacking you on one cheek, you'll turn the other cheek. Then you'll start understanding those that despitefully use you. Then you'll understand pray for those. Oh, my God. Love, folks. Amen. Are we under the law? Of course we are. If we want to be. When you can't find that kind of love, there's no place else for you to be. That's self-explanatory in this Bible. Paul would write these words. And I'll give you another one and I'll close. Right after the one of Paul. Paul would write, Bitter water and sweet water cannot come out of the same fountain. Hmm. Anybody believe that? But he said, Blessings and cursings come out of the same mouth, but it ought not be this way. Because we're not mechanical like that fountain is. But nonetheless, the point is so good that sweet water and bitter water cannot come out of the same fountain, Rookie. How do we know this? Jesus will go over to an island. He'll come up on the shore and there's a cemetery. There's a man up there. I've been running around naked for a long time. They ain't been able to hold him down. They can't chain him. They can't feather him. He breaks everything. He's got something messed up about him. He comes running down there and he bows down right before the Lord. He stands back up and basically this is what he says. I think it's word for word. I just haven't read it a long time. But he says, what have we to do with thee, Jesus? What have we to do with thee? And Jesus says, what's your name? He says, Legion, for we're many. What has this to do with this? They can't. You can't tell me you love me and do this. Oh, hold a minute now. You can't do it. Your Bible tells you, what have we to do with thee? What has malice to do with love? What has strife to do with love? Well, I don't care, brother. It, you know, this is the way we've always done it. Mama done it, daddy done it, grandmother done it, grandpa done it. We've just always done it this way, and it worked for them. Yeah, I bet it did work. The Bible says that if you live by the sword, you'll die by the sword. The Bible says that, do you know there's two judgments? I don't even want to go deep today. I, I, I told myself I would not go that deep today. Did you know that I'm going to stand before Christ one of these days? As a matter of fact, did you know He's coming back for His church? Now you understand why he says, if you love me, keep my commandments. 
They're not grievous. If you love me, you don't have a problem keeping them. If you love me, you want to do them because you love me. If you love me, keep my commandments. People say, well, you've got to keep the law. That is not what he's saying. The law is fulfilled in love. It's almost like Jesus saying, if you love me, uh, don't hurt me. If you love me, don't kill me. If you love me, don't lie about me. If you love me, you know, just, just do good to people. And then we start understanding that the, what we've done unto the least of these, my brother, and we've done unto him because I can't love Jesus and not love Harry. I mean, that's just what I know I pick on and I'm sorry all the time. You're my buddy and that's the only reason I do it. But that's what he's saying. Somebody else may come along and say, well, you know, this about Harry and this about Harry and this about Harry and this about Harry. And I'll say, oh, you don't know in the way I do. Yeah. You yeah. just know oh, he's not right here. If he was right here, you just want to help him, not, not go to a third party about it. I, there's no gossip in this church. I just need to throw that out there. There's nobody talking about each other. Yeah. What I am doing, as a matter of fact, right now, there, there's probably more healing in this church than what we've had in a long time. What I am doing right now is showing you that there's nothing greater than love. Amen. When somebody comes in and says, well, I just don't think God's like that. Well, that's fine. If you know him the way I know him, you know that uh, if I gained the whole world and lost my soul, it wouldn't profit me nothing. But if I can learn to love God, through what God's given me, through the visible things. If I can love God through this man right here. <laughs> he said, when I was naked, you clothed me. When I was thirsty, you gave me water. And he said, when did we do these things? If you love me, keep my commandments. Yeah. These are the commandments. These are the laws. But when you come through the law, how do you graduate this school? Man, when you get a set of eyes and look at somebody and say, neither do I condemn thee. Yeah. Christ didn't come to the world to condemn the world, but the world through him might be saved. All that, is that the point you get to? Yes, you do. If you ain't at that point, you back under the law. Now you feel that bondage. Now you feel that weight coming down on top of you. Yeah. I've been in churches many times. Me. Many, many times. My wife can tell you. I, I was probably the worst of the worst about we get in the car and on the way home, I can't believe this, I can't believe that. Get ready to go to church. Well, I hope that one sister ain't there. I, hope that, I mean, I was just like that for a long time. Go in there and think that I was righteous. Go in there thinking I was holy. Go in there and couldn't get a hold of nothing and got, got mad at people that could. Somebody else sitting in the pew right in front of me. Get up and shout and run all to church. And I'm sitting there, I don't feel a thing. Of course you don't feel a thing. You've got it all against somebody. You've got to let that go. But whenever you go in there, I used to tell my wife, this is true, but she'll remember. I know she, she thinks i got this great memory. Used to go to this church, and we always sit behind the same people. You know how it is when you got assigned seated churches. And, and this woman always had a hair, this great, great big old bun. Now, she had three feet of hair. I know that because she'd start shouting. But until that moment came, it was like 3,000 bobby pins. And folks, she'd get up, and I knew when it was going to happen. I, I sat behind her. I knew when it was going to happen. She, she would be sitting there, and I'd be behind her, and I'd start seeing her head. <laughs> and I, I got to a point where I grabbed Becky on the leg and I said, see, here she goes, she's getting ready. She'd jump out and go swinging around, next thing you know, her hair smacking people around the face. Bobby pins flying everywhere. I'd sit there, I, I, don't, I just tell Becky eventually I'm changing my seat. I'm not sitting behind that woman, she aggravates me so much. You know what, one day, all that changed. Now I'm so glad when I go into a church and I see anybody that just says, I just want to do something. I'm so glad when I see somebody come in and they can't even maybe walk half straight, but they can dance all over the church house. I'm so glad that I see people that fell in love with God and fell in love with each other where they're no longer afraid. Yeah. You know what fear will do to you? True <coughs> story. What fear will do to you? When I was little, I lived with my grandmother for a little over two years. And man... Uh, we grew up the boonies now. I, I'm, from, I'm from the Daniel Boone National Forest. Harry knows where I'm from. And all the time I was growing up, you need to watch for snakes. You need to watch for snakes. You need to watch for snakes. I couldn't even go out and check the mailbox about somebody telling me you need to watch for snakes. Well, there's a lot of snakes down there. Ain't no doubt about it. But boy, that stayed in me. And the, the, the beginning, the, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. That's the beginning. I, I understand this. Stay with me a minute. But I was so afraid. I mean, I was afraid of anything that moved. Now, one spring over at Granny's house, spent winter, I decided I'm going to go creeping off through the woods. I didn't get very far, maybe about from here to that stop sign, really. I thought I was a long way in the woods, but you know how it is when you're a kid. Maybe a little further. And there's this old piece of tin laying on the ground. 
And right as I get up to that piece of tin, something goes under it real fast. Something about that long, about that big around, just shoots under it real fast. I thought, that's a snake. That's a snake right there. And this is exactly what I did. I was probably nine, nine, and that piece of tin, it's like this blue piece of carpet. I got back as hard as I could, and I done that, and I didn't stop. I done one of them, I, that's where I learned that from. And I was stomping all over that piece of tin, right like that, that's true. And all of a sudden, something goes, meow, meow. And I got me a stick. And I raised up that tin. That mama cat had about four babies. And, oh, listen, y'all. Don't you judge me. Don't you judge me. I'm telling you now. That mama cat had about four babies. And by the grace of God, she covered them things up. And she was looking at me like, kind of like that. And she's all right. My heart just broke. I went in, and, and uh, you can ask my wife. She probably ain't even heard this story because. She thinks I hate cats. It's just I have, a, I have an issue. <laughs> I went to Grandma's and got a box. And I told my Grandma, I said, Grandma, I found some cats, some little babies, and I want to take care of them. And my fear almost killed me. My fear, I'm preaching, this good preaching today, Amen. nearly killed me. And they weren't what I thought they were. And a lot of times in America, if we could somehow get back to this place where the love of God that abounds back again, where I don't care if I don't care how long anything is or how short anything is, I don't care how many tattoos you got, I don't care. I just love you. I just love you. If you think you need it, wear it. But I love you. Because I get a feeling that that's exactly the issue we live with. Are we under the law? You may be. You'll know when you are. Are we living under grace? What do we do with the law? We keep it. It's for our safety. It'll guide us back every time. Paul says, I die daily. Paul realized there was a battle between the flesh and the spirit. That the law was created for that battle. Paul realized that I have power. Jesus said it this way, Tarry ye in Jerusalem till you, you are endued with power from on high. You are endued with power from on high. Why? Because if you don't have the love of God down in you and you go out and witness, you'll destroy somebody's life. Yeah. That's true. Brother Harry... We asked him if, if we could go with him this Wednesday. Some, some <coughs> young person that's already met him a couple of times praised him on the inter internet not too long ago and told him, go out there and just preach love and hope and peace to these people and tell them because somebody in their church has stood up and seen somebody preaching with such hatred that honest to God, if I, if I remember right, they said they'd rather spend eternity in hell than hear five minutes of this person. That's what our world is hearing and if we don't love one another, what makes us think that our, uh, the law is going to get us there? Did not a rich young man or a lawyer or something come to Jesus and say, what must I do? And he says, what does the law say? And he said, I've kept it all. I, I've heard preachers sit there and say, I doubt that. That boy probably sitting there lying through his teeth. No, I don't doubt it a bit. It's in the Bible. He said, I've kept it all since my youth. Jesus said, you like something. You like something because you're in the law. You like something. He said, take, it was the rich man, wasn't it? The guy that had a lot of wealth. He said, take all that you have, sell it to the poor, or sell it, give it to the poor, and come follow me. He's saying, you keep the law. You ain't killing nobody. You ain't talking about nobody, but you don't love nobody. You sit there and love yourself and you got all this stuff and it don't even move you when you pass by somebody else. Take all that you have, sell it, give it to them, just give it. Anybody hear that? Give and it shall be given. Anybody hear that? He said you lack. You kept the law. So when I meet people that says, well, I, you know, blah, 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 great. 
Keep every bit of it. But until you get a hold of the love of God, you'll find out it's not that you don't need the law. And you'll be thankful for the law. Because God says that this is your, how you love, if you love me, do these things. And you'll say, what must I do to prove my love to God? All I got to do is be good to people. Are you joking me? Oh, it's too easy. It confounds the wise, don't it? A, a, a fool won't even error therein. You mean all I really got to do is just try to love people, love the Lord thy God with all my heart, soul, and strength. And really, I can forget about all the commandments if I keep these two, to love the Lord thy God and to love my neighbor as myself. And because the whole law is fulfilled in that, how's the whole law fulfilled? In love. In love. In love. Are you living under the law? Some of you are. How does it feel? Heavy! Mm -hmm. I know, I've been there so many times. Can't hardly even bear to wait. But this thing about love is too simple because God would give them 40 years to prove them through the wilderness that He would be their God. That they could trust Him if they just love Him. But Lord, there's, is there no grace? We ought to just go back there. It had been easier. Back there is food. Back there is water. Here, all of a sudden, because when you really get to that kind of love, love no wonder wants. Love wants to give. Love is no longer about you. It's about the other person. Love is, have I done something to you? Or love is, can I do something for you? Brother Keith, I'll just share this. Maybe I, I know he don't, he, don't, he don't do his alms before men. Uh, I don't mean it that way. But a couple of times when he's traveled around the world, he's brought me something. I never asked for it. I don't even understand why he does it. I told Becky. But I, I know he cares about me. Because I don't ask him. If he done it because I asked him to, oh, this is getting deep. Then how would I know he loved me? I don't mean we're best friends for life. Could be. Could be. But I'm just saying the Bible says if you do for those that can do it back to you, you have your reward. If I take you out to eat and you take me out to eat, it may be sweet, but we ain't laid up no treasure in heaven. But if you do to those that can't do back to you, you mean if you forgive to somebody that ain't ready to forgive you? Well, that's what the Bible kind of says, ain't it? Just a little bit. You mean if you do it, pray for those that despitefully use you and love your enemies? Love your enemies. Those that can't do back. Now you have a reward up in heaven. You have a reward up in heaven. Grace is incredible. Grace is incredible. It's life. It's life. It's life. You guys know. You don't. That's one thing God created every bit of you in His likeness and His image. You know, men know. They know if I had more, I'd give more. If I could do more, I'd do more. But they know I love them. They know I love them. Not because I'm a pastor trying to make a name and use their name to build my church. They know I really just love them. As small as I am. And every one of you do too. That's what we do. Now, perfect love casts out all fear. Some people are afraid to be loved. They're afraid somebody use them. Or they've been used. Or they've been broken. How do we deal with that? We deal with that because He tells us but this mind of being you that is in Christ. You mean that law-breaking guy? No, that guy that loved you enough. That guy. What did he tell the leper? Hmm? You remember Elijah? I preached on that long, long ago. The, uh, Naaman went down and knocked on the door and Elijah wouldn't even come out. Wouldn't even come out because it was a leper. And the law would not let you. Leprosy has to be put out of the camp. God forbid a leper would even walk into a church in those days. I'm just telling you they'd be stoned and every priest in there that allowed it to happen be stoned right there on the spot because of the law. But when the leper come to Jesus, he said, Lord, if thou wilt, thou can make me whole. And the Bible says immediately he touched him. <coughs> Love will look past the sin. Love will fulfill the law. 
and saying, I will. When nobody else would touch him, no church would have him, he could not under the law even participate. Probably didn't have a wife or kids living a life of feeling so unaccepted like most Americans are today. But love will find a way to break through. Amen. Love says immediately he touched him. <coughs> That's love. Amen. Do you live under the law? Well, I think you got a pretty good idea if you do or if you don't. I think you got a pretty good idea of churches that do, churches that don't, and those that mess the whole thing up. Because they don't realize that you need one as much as you need the other. And you don't realize that even God gave it to you for you and for humanity to keep them safe. And to teach us how to love one another is to teach us how to love Him. And God said, don't you do away with the law. You keep my commandments. But you find this grace. You find that you need a Savior too. That that law, it could bring you to Him. But what it could not do, He was able to do. Why? Because while you were yet in your sin, He died on the cross of Calvary. Let's stand this morning. Stand this morning in this house. I know we're going to shout and tear the chandeliers down. I expect a revival to be that way. Amen. We can always get in our chandelier. We need to shout it. That's what we need. Don't you worry about the lights. We can get more lights. We need somebody to break through this thing. To punch through it. And say, you know what? Say them words of that Baptist preacher up there in Washington, D.C. Free at last. Yeah. Free at last. Great God Almighty, I'm free at last. Amen. Woo! I feel it in my soul. I don't harbor nothing. I don't resent nobody. I love everybody. I think everybody knows that. I'm free. I'm free in God. I'm free in Christ. Man, I'll tell you, that's just the truth. I, I, I got to shut up, don't I? I can just go on. <laughs> I love the Lord because He first loved me. Said, you did not choose me. I chose you. Amen. Because He first loved me. Because He lives, I can face tomorrow. Yes, I might amen. face a few critics along the way. I'll just look at them and say, Brother, you got to love me a little bit more than that. Give me half a chance. Amen. Let's bow our heads this morning. I'll ask Sister Amanda if she'll come and play and sing for us this morning. It's all right with Sister Christy. I know she loves her enough to let her do that. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Father, I just pray for us in here this morning. Not God, because necessarily we need to love each other more. We can always do that. But Lord, if we could look out the windows on our way home, see that little girl that ain't got nothing, just like Dakota last Sunday, Lord, that walked up to this table with me and I give her a drink. That was such a small thing. But Lord, you could send somebody by that home. I know you could. Lord, the, the lady that ain't got a job, and her belly's out to here. And the parents are saying, well, you deal with it. God, you love us more than that. If our churches here in America would ever just accept the love that you give us and then deny ourselves, deny ourselves, and pick up that cross, then we would learn to say, here I am, send me. Here I am, God. Here I am, God. Send me. Father, I pray for every vessel in here this morning. I know there's future preachers, future pastors right here today. But God, even greater than that, they're your children and your family. I ask your blessings be on our life this morning. God, I just ask you to open up this altar. God, let us all be ready to say, Lord, I just need more of your love. More of your love. Get rid of the fear that I have that's holding me back from doing the things I know you want me to do in my life. Just give me your love this morning. In Jesus' mighty name and amen. While she sings this morning, I'm just going to open the altar. Folks, it's the place where I met him. It's still the place where he dwells. It's the place where you find mercy. It's the place where you find rest. Some of the callings in this church are so great. I know that the devil's trying to stop I, I know.